Hello, welcome back to um, Lisa Talking. We're on our regular Sunday history series and this week I'm going to be looking at the Persians and the Greeks. Now, these two identities both represent very distinct stages for our civilization. They're both very important in their own right. But before I kind of get to the stage where we're looking at them separately as the Persians and the Greeks as separate entities, I want to look at the period during which these identities come into being because what you're actually talking about here is two sons from the same mother you're talking about the same territories you're talking about intertwined cultures intertwined dynasties and actually it's not as clear-cut the division between them as you might imagine <coughs> and I also wanted to use this to actually start to break down the geography of the Eurasian steppe itself so, when you look at the Eurasian steppe on a map, you can see two main bodies of water, the Caspian Sea and the Black Sea. And well, when you're talking about very, very early civilization, you're talking about civilizations who literally, their organization with the Nile, that's like the, the, the civilization is developing around, like geography drives history because geography drives civilization these main water bodies are incredibly important in kind of the organization of the steppe from its very roots and are at the very roots of these civilizations. Now the Black Sea in particular has a very very important role to play here and I'm going to read you a passage from a document called the Enuma Elish. Now, the Enuma Elish is a creation myth from Mesopotamian civilization. The version that I'm going to read is actually from a tablet that emerges in Babylonian civilization. So you remember we talked about the emergence of Babylonian civilization in reaction to this kind of system of governance with these high priestesses from the Eurasian steppe that use the mountain bases that punctuate the steppe. So the Enuma Elish is kind of one of the best copies we've got which represents their creation myth. So they are discussing kind of in the same way as we use the stories of Adam and Eve in Genesis to discuss kind of ancient Mesopotamian civilization, this highly symbolic writing. They are doing the same to discuss the area around the Black Sea. So it says, when in the height heaven was not named, and the earth beneath did not yet bear a name, and the primeval Apsu who begat them, and Chaos, Tiamat, the mother of them both, their waters were mingled together, no field was formed, no marsh was to be seen, when none of the gods when when of the gods none had been called into being. Now Tiamat in this kind of parable is um, the salt water. And Apsu is the primeval fresh water. Now what was not abundantly clear, we had assumed that this is about kind of imagined gods and goddesses. But in actual fact, what we've recently learned about the Black Sea means that now we can quite firmly say that this is a passage about the Black Sea itself. Now, the Black Sea is currently a saltwater sea, and it's linked to the Aegean and the Mediterranean by a little passage called the Bosphorus Straits. And it's on this kind of water strait that the city of Istanbul that used to be Constantinople was Byzantium before it was actually placed because this was incredibly strategically significant this was the Roman Empire moved east to make this its power base but the period where the Bosphorus Straits forms like there's a transformation of the Black Sea so during the Ice Age, it's an actual freshwater lake. So during the Ice Age, we talked about how the Persian Gulf area, which where Mesopotamian civilization forms, how that's shaped by post-Ice Age flooding. During the Ice Age, before this landscape has formed, the Black Sea is a freshwater lake. It has settlements around it. There is civilization here going back so far that they're using woolly mammoth tusks to make fireplaces. This is very, very old. 
and the Bosphorus Straits, it opens up. Now the Black Sea is a freshwater lake during the Ice Age and it kind of changes its size. So when, apparently when the Ice Age, I'm not, you know, I'm not a geographer, but when the Ice Age begins, the freezing of the water means that water is lifted out of it and the Ice Age melting deposits a lot of water back in which forms the cliffs around it. There's a lot of interest in the minute at the Paleo shoreline and civilizations that might be evidence there. But when the Bosphorus Straits opens, salt water begins to come into the Black Sea. The fresh water is gradually replaced and turned into salt water. Now, when salt water and fresh water meet in a watercourse, it's very, very fertile. It's called brackish water. But in Mesopotamian literature, the salt water meeting the sweet is a repeated metaphor. Probably one of the reasons that the Jordan Valley became so significant and sacred is the Dead Sea and the Galilee meeting. In this mythology, Tiamat, the mother goddess, is the Black Sea itself. Apsu is the fresh water it was before it was Tiamat. The period where the waters mingled together, however long that might have taken, is the period where the gods come into being. Now, when you're talking about early civilization, especially Egyptian mythology, Mesopotamia, the earliest gods, you know, there's usually a period, I think Min Lee calls it the period of the demigods and god kings. When they're talking about the earliest gods in their foundation mythology, they're generally talking about people and elite formation, usually leading to kingship. So what we're talking about here is a period where the salt water from the Mediterranean is coming into the Black Sea and it's becoming a salt water sea. It actually becomes, they talk about how the mother goddess became very, very angry. It's a very difficult sea to sail. But Tiamat, the mother goddess, is actually the Black Sea in Mesopotamian literature. Now, there are two civilizations that I wanted to call your attention to on the Black Sea. There's one at the Varna Necropolis, which is in Bulgaria. Now, the Varna Necropolis was discovered in, I think, 1972. It's got like two, three hundred graves in it. And like these, it is chock full of gold. Like an elite has formed here. There is more gold for, found in these, this necropolis than in the rest of the world combined. Now, the Black Sea has several rivers running to it. The Volga, which runs through um, Russia, the river that kind of runs through Europe. They kind of come and meet here. This is how this civilization are organizing. And here an elite has formed where there is so much gold that it's actually astonishing. But what's more astonishing than the quantity of gold is the items that are here. So there are little gold standards in the shape of animals. Now, throughout Europe and throughout the steppe, a, a civilization we call the Scythians actually continue to reproduce these standards and they become more and more developed and they're still seen in like the first century, I think, but I can't remember. But these little gold standards, as well as being portable items, items that show status because they're made of gold, they're also mathematical instruments. They've got little holes in them so you can work out angles. The geometry that this civilization is using is very advanced. They are able to use um, what we later come to call the Fibonacci numbers. In the ceramic decorations, we can see the use of these geometric forms. They are using equilateral triangles and working out angles. Now, I'm quite interested in the history of mathematics, um, particularly the mathematics that was used in Mesopotamian civilization for building the canals, which was very much linked to these high priestesses. Equations used to be sung. The status that these little ghost standards ish that indicate is not only about the gold that they're made of, but about the knowledge that they indicate. Now, some of the other items within this treasure are also very interesting. The, one, the very high status burials where they're holding a measuring rod, another crafted out of gold with kind of, like, they look about an inch to me, like measurements along it, it's a measuring rod. Now this measuring rod is clearly a symbol of authority and it's actually a symbol that's reproduced. It's reproduced in Mesopotamian literature, Inanna in the underworld, when the city-states turn against her and she's kind of descending into the underworld. She actually takes her measuring rod in right up to the revelation of John in the New Testament. It discusses the measuring rod to measure out the temple. This is about religious authority. 
the Quran itself is said to be the measuring rod. The Quran and the Bible, the biblical texts, are actually regulatory texts for like the priestly class and people using the power of God. And this mythology in Mesopotamia is about regret at the gods coming into being. This is a civilization at the root of this. Now there's another civilization up in Romania called the Cucuteni, I think, Tripilia. I'll put their details underneath. And they show evidence of a very different organizational system. Whereas the Vana Necropolis is about an elite forming with an immense wealth, which by the way, generally means instability. And that's what's described in the Mesopotamian literature. This civilization seemed to have emerged to avoid elite formation. They, um, they produce ceramics, they have a potter's wheel, they make toys, very, very sophisticated toys for their children that show that they're using the wheel in day-to-day -day kind of life and on their actual, and this is actually reminiscent of the civilization we discussed at Eridu. They have these little figurines, which we assume are the mother goddess, which are very distinctly shaped and come to a point. This is really interesting because King Shulgi of Ur in Mesopotamia, who's represented as Shem in the Bible, this is the shape that he chooses to make his own figurines that represent him. His tenure is represented as bringing the power of these high priestesses to the core of governance. These figurines are found in lots of places, which indicates trade and relationship. But there's also one bunch of islands where there's 13 of these figurines in a circle that represents a council. Mesopotamian mythology discusses a council of gods that they kind of appear to. And what you have here is two civilizations that are incredibly early. We can't, I don't know how you would go about doing There are issues with carbon dating at the moment because we're having to really stretch our understanding of how old civilization is. But from both of these civilizations with these very different systems of governance, one where there's very clearly a very wealthy elite and religious authority over religion, and the other where there's a very different form of governance, symbols from both are appearing in Mesopotamian civilization and represented in Mesopotamian literature, which again is at the roots of our systems, because actually, you know, this is still represented in the Quranic and biblical texts. Now, this kind of civilization that emerges around the Black Sea, we keep saying that this is the earliest civilizations in Europe, but this distinction of Europe is not kind of, it doesn't exist for a very long time. This is the civilization at the roots of those identities. And the root that we can see is that this is shaping Mesopotamian civilization, but this is also at the roots of Greek civilization. So we have the story of Cadmus, who's the first hero in Greek mythology. And you remember we talked about Greek language doesn't develop properly until about 700 years in the way that we would understand it after the Bronze Age. Well, Cadmus is associated with the earliest language in Greek civilization. He's the grandson of the sea god. Um, he's associated with writing, but we know it can't be Phoenician because that doesn't emerge till the Bronze Age collapse, which means that he's associated with Linear A and B, which are undecipherable scripts associated with the Minoans and the Mycenaeans. He's associated with the roots of the Spartans. Like I think he throws teeth on the ground and the Spartan warriors appear or whatever. These are deeply symbolic stories. The Dorians, who, over, who are said to overthrow the Mycenaeans, they have roots in the Black Sea. The Thracian women associated with the Isle of Lemnos that we discussed have roots at the Black Sea. But the same also goes for Persian civilization. So in the, Inanna goes to the underworld when she kind of gets her measuring rod because all the city states have deserted her. She says she clasps the seven me to her chest. In actual fact, the root word that's referred to here is Parsi, which is the root word of Persia. Now, Iran's geography is very, very interesting. If you look at Iran on a map, they're kind of a W shape, and the cleft of it is in the Persian Gulf. It's very much like a W shape. And they occupy, have always occupied a very important role in the, in the kind of, as the divide between West and East, the, the middle point. They are shaped by the tensions created by trade routes with the Persian Gulf and the sea. 
They are also connected to the Caspian Sea and they're connected to the steppe. The river that forms the border between the Arabian Peninsula and Iran is actually formed of this post-glacial flooding and still forms more or less the border today and is always pretty much the natural axis politically in the Middle East still. And Iran as a geography, all the civilizations that emerge here are shaped by these tensions. They have to balance the tensions created by nomadic, it's formed of nomadic people, connection to the steppe, connection to the Caspian Sea, and connection to kind of the Persian Gulf. The, the actual internal geography of Iran, if you look, it's kind of like a triangle of mountain race, ranges with a plateau which was the home of multiple nomadic mountain people. Now, in order to understand the development of kind of civilization in Iran, it's this geography you have to understand. These are often nomadic mountain people that did not leave records. The modern day Kurds trace their roots back to here. Now, when you're trying to piece together this history, it's understanding this geography that allows you to understand it. One of the first civilizations that emerges that we recognize in Iran is the Elamites. And the Elamites form a, a city called Susa. And Susa is an incredibly important word. Now, understanding the development of civilization in this geography, you have to kind of not only understand Persian sources, which don't come till much later, you have to understand kind of Mesopotamian sources, you have to understand Hebrew sources right through to the beginnings of dynastic Persia, and you have to understand Greek sources, because this is actually like, without care, this is a territory that would just become a thoroughfare. It's always shaped by the different balances of power from West and East. Now in the Hebrew text, there's um, a strange dualism around Persia, which is directly rooted to the double naming system that we talked about in Canaan. This is a text where certain things are hidden for very good reasons. The Persians are called the Kadosh, which kind of is basically the same root as holy, the holy ones. Um, I'm trying to think, like Susanna, if you read the second kind of chapter of Song of Songs, it's Ani Habashleft Hasharon Susanat Hamakim, I am the lily of the valleys. When Inanna goes to the underworld, it's the mountain people who stay loyal to her. In the stories of Noah in the Bible, representing the third dynasty of Ur, the gap between the Akkadian Empire and the third dynasty of Ur, the Gutians are the dynasty that kind of take over after the disintegration of the Akkadians. And it's actually the Gutians who are central to the holy covenant that Noah represents and Nama represents. This is something that continues throughout the Hebrew text at every single stage in renewal of covenant, which is usually re related to wider real world instability. This place is central. Now this kind of continues. The, there's a, the story in Greek mythology that links these two civilizations is the story of Jason and the Argonauts. Now, in the last couple of weeks, I've been talking about the instability that's represented by Solomon, the reintroduction of practices like sacred marriage to, you know, the site that we call Petra, the fracturing of political union that means that Meroe becomes a power base. Jason and the Argonauts starts with King Salmoneus and the disruption that's caused by King Salmoneus. I talked about the fact that Greek civilization, the civilization that had emerged from the Mycenaeans went into a dark age, is at the Bronze Age, and they re-emerge into this political engine. Jason and the Argonauts is the story that represents this. Jason is a Greek explorer who's trying to get access to these territories on the te on the steppe. He goes to Lemnos, the island that we discussed related to the to the Minoans, where the Thracian women have been. Um, he wants to find the Golden Fleece, which is representative of Georgia, the country that's in the middle of the Caspian Sea and the Black Sea. They can actually pan for gold using a fleece here. And he actually marries a woman called Medea. Now Medea or Medea, Mede is the central word, it's the same as the root word for median, it means middle. 
and it's actually this marriage that's actually kind of at the core of kind of Greek identity formation about this relationship between the Greeks and the Persians. Jason betrays her. It's a terribly complex story, but he betrays her after they kind of, he, he gets the golden fleece, he wins what he needs to. And I like, she basically, I think she kills her children. I'm not entirely sure. Like I've got a friend who really thinks I haven't read like Euripides in years and years and years, and I'm actually going to reread it quite soon. But this is actually a foundation myth in Greek civilization about the links between these civilizations, and it's actually this period of instability that's covered by. We talked about kind of the biblical stories of Solomon and how they represented the disintegration of this political engine that's based at Holy Mountain Kadesh and kind of the reintroduction of practices that fracture this political and holy covenant so that power moves to Meroe. This is actually a period of deep instability on the steppe. And it's actually during this period that you start to see the formation of a recognizable Median empire. These different tribal nomadic peoples have to come together as a coherent political entity to stand up to the threat of the Assyrians. This is also a threat that's generated the Assyrians occupy Egypt. The Nubians kind of have to stand up against them. All the different territories that have been bound together we discussed forming the basis of this political and economic kind of a religious network. They have to kind of bind to stand up to the Assyrians. We see the emergence of the media, the Medes, the Median Empire. This is a political entity that's formed through the frontier of the Assyrians with all these tribal nomadic people. Now the period that's quite important to understand, there's quite an important episode in Jewish history here, <coughs> which actually is about this, and it's called the Jewish Exile. Now if you, it's quite hard to put piece together, kind of, you have to piece together kind of the Hebrew sources and kind of the, the secular sources to figure out what's gone on here. The median, the, the starting point for dynastic kind of Persia is a man called Cyrus the Great, and he's not the first king of the Median Empire, but he features in the Bible as being anointed by God. And we've discussed before with the stories of King David, this is largely, I'm not, like, I'm really sorry, I'm not religious, I don't, but this is actually about a political authority. He is the man who is appointed to quell the instability that has been generated by this kind of trouble that is kind of symbolized by the stories of Solomon, but which has involved the rise of the Median, of the Median Empire, and has actually also involved the Jewish exile. The Jewish exile itself, it's difficult to see what's happened, but if you read the book of Judith, she dis like it discusses that Jehoiakim, who's the last descendant of Solomon, has secured the Cilician Gate, presumably so these people could be marched to Babylon, and she beheads the, Jew the Assyrian leader after seducing him to prevent this. In Psalm 137, it says, um, by the rivers of Babylon, when we sat down, which indicates these people did, and they would have had to march through Median territory. Um, it, it describes babies being bashed onto rocks. Now in Psalm 137, it says that the children of Moab tore the temple down. And you have to be very careful with Hebrew text because there's a dualism in the text. The curse of Canaan is about presenting, you know, a front face to protect this political engine. In the, even in the name of Cadmus, the first Greek hero we discussed, his name actually means kind of a front. The dualism in the text, when you look through Hebrew text, it's simultaneously, whenever it says about the Persians what they actually are, Kadosh, the holy ones, it will say something disparaging because this is about presenting an image of rivalry. The dualism and rivalry employed in the text is a literary device to hide the covenant and the relationships underneath. Cyrus the Great is anointed after the period of the Jewish exile to provide calm to the waters. He's anointed in the Bible and in secular sources we have the Cirrus, the Cirrus Cylinder, which is actually incredibly important in the history of the rule of law. This is like an attempt at granting everybody rights. When you look at Persepolis, which is the palace associated with him, there are 23 different peoples paying tribute to him. 23 plus 1 equals 24. There are 24 different peoples represented in the tribal federation of Exodus. 
the period of Cyrus the Great is the period where you begin to see all the people that were bound in this tribal federation visibly and the expanse of these territories. Now the period between Cyrus the Great and I think Alexander, I think it's a good couple of hundred years. I, I don't want to restart the video to go and check, but this is a very serious period of development for civilization. Cyrus the Great has a reputation even among his peers. There's kind of disparity in some of the sources about how he kind of comes to power. Is it conquest? Is it man marriage? I tend to think Xenophon is a bit more reliable than Herodotus on this because Xenophon was very much shaped by kind of this period. But Cyrus the Great, he kind of, while he I don't think he ever shares his religious views, I don't think, but our understanding of monotheism is not, you know, we're judging it with modern eyes. The submission to one system here is about being bound by principles above the individual pantheons of gods that each civilization has. The archaeological evidence is that all these territories still maintain various gods. In the Ten Commandments, it's about thou shalt have no gods before me. Leviticus is a codification of a wide range of religious practices. Um, the it's and one of the key ones is that we that's core to the Abrahamic covenant is the end to things like sacred marriage and child sacrifice. In actual fact, if you look at kind of Greek like the religious practices across this region. The, there are very common themes. Sacrifice is something that they do. Socrates' death scene involves a chicken that's sacrificed. And the use of a woman as an oracle. Josephus describes kind of a breastplate twinkling on an oracle who would be consulted. The Holy of Holies means she will only be consulted once a year. The Kaaba is about protecting this woman. In Greece, it's the Delphine Oracle. It's kind of the same, same, but different. There are marked differences with the Abrahamic Covenant, including this wider political organization, which this tribal federation and these shared values and practices. In the Book of Susanna, which actually describes um, King Jehoiakim in Babylon in exile, it's a description of, like in Josephus it, and in the Book of Daniel, it's kind of euphemistically that he's, he's taken the temple goods with him. But it means this woman, the Book of Susanna, refers to Susa, the lily of the valleys. He's allowing her to be harmed and she's kind of being peered at by this, um, the, the tree is a very symbolic tree, it's a, it's a resin tree called mastic. But she is being kind of violated by these kind of judges who've been kind of voyeuristically watching her. This is about the fact that she doesn't have the protection of the Kaaba anymore. She doesn't have the protection of the Holy of Holies. He's having her abused. The, the text is very coded in its writing. You can't just approach Hebrew texts and take them literally. You have to understand the coding in the writing. It discusses cutting the tree down but leaving the stump. This is a marked change in the development of these texts, the texts that we understand as the source of the Bible. They come into being around now, around this period. But this is also a period of economic advancement for all these territories. The Athenians are very much emulating the Persian kind of culture at this point. The technology, if you look at the architecture that we later come to associate with Greek civilization, the pillars, Persepolis has a hundred pillars in the hall. The ritual baths that become the mikvah in Hebrew tradition, uh, where they have to be connected to a natural spring, are very much connected to kind of the early, the early baths of the Persian baths that are rooted in Elamite civilization. The roots of monotheism as we understand it are here in Persia with Zoroastrianism and Zuhura Mazda. Everywhere else it's more about agreeing to overarching principles that are above the kind of individual pantheons of gods and goddesses of different civilizations. The roots of the monotheism that we come to understand as monotheism are very much rooted here in Iranian civilization with Zoroastrianism. Now this civilization is very, very developed, but what's also happening is in Greece, like the, the geography of Greece is incredibly interesting. It's lots of islands and city-states, so it's lots of different ways of organizing and lots of discussion about how we should organize. The word monarchy comes from the Greek word one ruler, one archon, mono archon, monarch. 
oligarchy is how the Spartans are organizing, which is a powerful military elite. Democracy is being trialed, although it doesn't include women, slaves or foreigners, but it's still being tried here. This is a very intense political and intellectual environment that's giving birth to kind of Greek philosophy. One of the reasons I don't get on with Plato is I can recognize that Plato is largely earlier philosophy with stuff stripped out of it, but it's actually the loss of those traditions that allows it to become so versatile and the center of this intellectual environment. And this is happening while the Persians are controlling all these territories. But only, only Cyrus is actually named in the Bible as anointed by God. And the dynastic succession after Cyrus is a bit different. Now, there's a guy called Darius the Great, and there's kind of a suspicion that he knocked off Cyrus, he's his actual kind of successor, the successor to the natural successor to the King of Kings. There's a suspicion that Darius the Great possibly killed him. And the Achaemenid dynasty actually comes from this point, and then from this point on, it's normal dynastic succession and power structures. And while you see an organization of these territories, the establishment of satraptes and, you know, very, very sophisticated governance, what's also happening is this Greek identity is emerging and the Persian identity is becoming stronger and reverting back. You can see in the artifacts, the Persian artifacts refer back to Mesopotamian roots, while the Greek identity is much newer and much younger. And by the time you get to Philip of Macedon, the father of Alexander the Great, you're talking about a very stark identity divide, very mature policies, but polities, but you're also talking, it's actually just become Persian dominance. It's perceived that the Persians are subordinating people. Now, Alexander the Great, I don't even know how we, how we ever got the Great title, really. He's the product of a very long established dynastic plan. His mother and father have their marriage rights at Lemnos, which entitles them to the mysteries of the Cabero, which gives them access to the Cilician Gate. Philip of Macedon is very, very, very powerful. And it's a period where these different Greek entities are coming together. When you read the stories of the Greek and Persian wars through Herodotus, what you're discussing is lots of people who were previously part of the covenant that Cyrus the Great protected, rising up against it. And Alexander the Great, I think he gets access to the royal road that, Sir, that Cyrus the Great has built between kind of Susa and the Aegean. And it's actually the combination of having the Cilician Gate and this royal road that give us clues as to why his military conquest was so speedy. But this is a plan that's been coming into being for a very long time in an existing polity. And it's only really here that you start to see a very substantial split of the Persian identity and the Greek identity as two distinct civilizations. The story of the Gordian knot, we discussed in the kind of discussion about kind of Hattusha and Gordian and, you know, the territories we would call Turkey. The prophecy was that the person who can undo the Gordian knot will rule all Asia. Well, Alexander doesn't undo it. He slices right through it. These are very symbolic stories. Now, the book of Daniel, next week we're going to look at the wars that strike out after Alexander the Great dies. We're going to look at Alexander the Great's tenure and we're going to look at the books of Daniel and the books of Susanna and a prayer called the prayer for the three holy children. And we're going to look at what these texts tell us and we're going to look at this period. But we're going to continue to look at Greek civilization, particularly as they expand westwards. We're going to look, them, look at them in relation to the rise of Rome, as in Rome based in Rome in Italy, and also as central to Greek civilization shaping the Roman Empire when they become the Byzantine Empire. But next week, what we're going to discuss is the territories that we call Armenia and Georgia, these territories in the middle of the Caspian and the Black Sea. And the territories that we discuss as Central Asia, because they're actually understanding Greek civilization is very much understanding these territories, including Afghanistan. And what you're going to see is that both 
like Greek civilization is not quite the like Roman civilization is very much about subordination. Greek civilization comes to dominate this span of territories that we have been discussing that have emerged over the last few videos that we've been discussing that then come under Persian control and are shaped very much by this Persian period. Then this is actually the foundation of Greek civilization. This territory of the Eurasian steppe is central to it. Greek civilization is not just based at the Greek islands. And it's about the Greek kind of identity and a symbiosis with a multitude of civilizations and identities. So we're going to come back and we're going to discuss that next week. I'm going to be back on Wednesday with my second part in the series about what broke Britain. Thank you very much for staying with me today. I will make my list of sources underneath. It's taken me a good few takes to get this one today. So thank you for sticking with me and I'll see you on Wednesday.